Welcome back to Paleo Talks, everyone. We are on episode 54, and today we have Dr. Holly Woodward. How are you doing, Holly? I'm good. How are you? Doing excellent. Doing excellent. And we have David. How are you doing, David? Doing good. And Chris down here, too. Howdy. I think this is actually the first time, Chris, that you and I have been this close together when we're doing paleo talks. We only <laughs> You're have about probably eight right. between us right now. <laughs> You're just on the other side of those those bookcases just, behind. Just right me. there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about histology and uh, dinosaurs. I'm really excited about this topic uh, for a lot of different reasons: argosaur interests, uh, but also some potential mammal questions. And I am just uh, so thrilled to see the audience that we have right now. People from all over the world are, are joining us today. Before we talk any more, uh, before I talk any more, I should say, uh, let's get over to David and we'll come back and introduce Holly in a little more detail. But David, if you could remind everybody how the show works. Sure thing. We're going to officially introduce our guest here in just a second and then uh, go into the main presentation at which point we hope everyone will enjoy watching and think of questions you have, because when the presentation is over, the remainder of the program is going to be Q&A time. At that time, I will remind you to go ahead and leave your questions in the comments of the Facebook video. We'll read them out uh, for our guests to answer. And as always, if for any reason you can't leave a comment in the Facebook uh, chat in the Facebook comments, you can send us your question at the Gray Fossil Site accounts on Instagram or Twitter, that's Gray Fossil Site on Instagram and Twitter. I'll be keeping an eye over there as well. All right, thank you, David. Just a reminder to everybody, we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee, and also the Gray Fossil Site where we oversee research of this extraordinary 5 million year old sinkhole deposit that has all sorts of critters and is incredibly exciting place uh, to be. And hopefully, if you haven't been here before, uh, we encourage you all to come and visit us. I'm Blaine Schubert, and we have Holly Woodward with us. And Holly, the way that we actually do our introductions is we turn it over to you. And so okay. we would like you to tell us all about yourself, but starting with how did you get into paleontology in the first place? What led you down this path of paleontological studies? Uh, where'd you go to universities? And how did you end up at your current position and what do you do research on? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, well, first I should say, I, I sound a little funny. I'm a little uh, head coldy today. Uh, it turns out my immune system is not really prepared to jump back into social uh, socializing in general after you know isolating for the better half of 2020. So um, sorry for sounding funny, but oh well. You sound great to us. <laughs> um, so regarding, uh, I guess, how I got started, I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in dinosaurs. And, um, you know, my parents would take me to museums and get me dinosaur books and toys and just sort of fed the beast there, I guess. Um, always encouraged me to, to learn more about nature and science and, um, you know, they never told me being a paleontologist was ridiculous. They always said, you know, if that's what you want to do, then you can do it. So I believe them. <laughs> and, you know, from there, just sort of pursued my interests and went to, uh, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I went to NC State in Raleigh for undergrad. And, um, you know, I was able there to take paleo related or concentrated courses from Dale Russell as well as Reese Barrett. So that was pretty exciting at, you know, that young fledgling age to be able to meet some pretty awesome paleontologists. And then um, I went and did my master's at Texas Tech in Lubbock under Tom Lehman. And that's when I really started getting interested in histology. Um, he's the one who actually said, well, you know, I've got these big dinosaur bones from Alamosaurus. Let's cut them up and see what they look like inside. So that's where that fascination started. And then I decided, you know, after doing two years studying sauropods um, using a microscope, I, for some reason, wanted to continue doing some, um, something similar. So I went to um, 
Montana State University and uh, uh, Jack Horner took me on as his student. And he said sauropods were too big and I should focus on something a little smaller. So I started um, thin sectioning Myasaura, which is a, a duckbill dinosaur, and um, sort of looked at the histology of as many as I possibly could for my dissertation. And um, just sort of went on from there. Now I basically will thin section anything with legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after I graduated uh, with my PhD at Montana State, I went on to become part of the faculty of anatomy and vertebrate paleontology at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, it's, it's a really interesting mix of of people there because it's a medical school. And then we've got this nucleus of paleontologists within the medical school. And um, it, it works out pretty, uh, pretty awesome in that uh, we're able to get some ideas from the medical school side of things and say, huh, wouldn't that be cool to apply micro CT to paleo or you know, paleohistology? Um, what are you guys doing on the medical side of things that we could use in paleo and then vice versa. Um, so it's, it's a really cool, interesting mix of people there. And um, in particular, I teach first year medical students human anatomy. And then, um, you know, in the summer and during my research time, I will go out, uh, excavate dinosaur fossils and bring them back to the lab to make thin section of and learn more about them. So uh, I guess that's sort of my life in a nutshell there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's fascinating to me, um, and I'm, I've been learning this more and more about the opportunities for paleontologists in departments that are, you know, more anatomy related or human anatomy related. It seems to be one mm -hmm. of the growing opportunities out there. Yeah, it's um, it's a really nice niche because, uh, as well, you know, to be fair, med students are like, why on earth is someone with a geology degree and, you know, a paleontologist teaching me about the human body and human anatomy. And, um, you know, it's a great question. And it's, it's a really interesting thing to explain to them that in order to understand about past life, you have to know the ins and outs of physiology and studying modern animals and in particular humans, um, because we know pretty much the most, and um, as far as anatomy goes, uh, about the human body. And, and so, um, you know, we get to be really good comparative anatomists that way. And then, you know, everyone else that goes through such a program goes on to become, you know, medical doctors and it's the paleontologists that are like, Hey, yeah, I'll, I'll teach you guys about anatomy. That's, that's no problem. I'll stick behind, you know, I don't need to go on and practice. So, you know, it works out for us too. That's great. Well, if you would go ahead and show your presentation, share the slides. All right, is that coming up? There we go, go ahead and get started. Awesome, great. All right, so um, as I was saying, I really became interested in paleohistology as a master's student. And um, histology is the study of tissue microstructures. And so for paleohistology, most of the time, you know, unless you're super, super lucky, the only thing that is really around for you to look at are bones. So uh, a special um, a subset of histology would be osteohistology or, or bone histology. And so that's what I started to focus on um, during my master's degree and as a graduate student um, in the PhD program. And, you know, I thought of bone as this mystical, magical thing that, um, wow, it's going to tell me so much about animals, you know, there must be so much to learn about it. But this picture is pretty much like if you take a histology class, they don't spend, you know, months and months talking about bone. I think two weeks is probably the max you talk about bone histology because there's so many other tissue types. Uh, so it was a, a bit amazing to me to see, you know, this picture basically shows you the anatomy of every long bone in the body. And then, you know, the next thing you learn is that 
bone mineral is called hydroxyapatite and there's its chemical formula. And then bone is developed either intramembranously or endochondrally. And I don't expect you guys to, to focus in on this busy slide and remember any of this, but basically these three things are what you learn about bone. And the take home message from this is that bone is bone. So bone in a human, bone in a cat, bone in an owl, for example, it's all hydroxyapatite. It all has the same anatomy and it's all just the stuff that, that makes the skeleton, right? So that was sort of, um, it was a mind altering concept for me because of what you could do with that. Bone isn't really special, but that's what makes it special. And so it was just like, psh, whoa. Um, because what that means is that if we can understand bone and what it's telling us in modern animals, then we can use what we see in the bone tissue structure and what it means, if we can figure that out, then we can go to the fossil record. And if we see those same structures in a fossil, a uh, Dimetrodon, Pterosaur, Dinosaur, Mammoth, Mastodon, whatever it is, we can make inferences and say, oh, this must have been growing similarly to X, what we see alive today. So the fact that bone is bone is just amazing because that means that all the same rules apply, which is super cool. So with bone tissue microstructure or histology, we can actually learn a lot about an animal and everything that I'm putting up on the screen right now has been uh, empirically tested with modern animals today. And these are the things that we know bone tissue microstructure can tell us about living animals. So that includes, you know, how old was it when it died? Uh, was it a baby when it died? Was it nearing adult, um, uh, adult maturity when it died? Um, how fast did such an animal grow from year to year? Um, was this animal, if you just found its bones, a juvenile of one particular species or an adult of another particular species? Um, sometimes you can even tell the sex of the animal and um, whether or not it uh, had reached reproductive age. And then of course, uh, one of the more cool things I think is uh, to be able to infer illness or injury from the bones, just being able to study that bone record and, and observe what's going on within the tissue. So with that, I wanted to provide you guys with some bone basics. So basically after today, you guys will have come out with a, come away with a, um, a bone histology course and be a junior paleohistologist yourselves. Um, so with bone, um, you know, you, you mostly just think of it as, or a lot of people just think of it as something that uh, acts as a scaffolding for muscle, you know, provides a shape to the body. But as I showed earlier, there's a lot of anatomy within a bone. So you've got the bone shaft, the marrow cavity, um, you know, you've got your epiphyses. But then if we really zoom in and look at the histology, from a microscopic perspective, you see all kinds of stuff in the bone. So if we look at this little pizza wedge of bone, um, you'll see bone cells, you'll see blood vessels, you'll see nerves. So you don't really think of bone as a living tissue, but it is a living tissue. It has cells that, needs nourish that need nourishment. And because it's a living tissue, this is how we get a bone record of growth. This is how we can read bone and understand what happened to the animal throughout its life until it died. So the first thing I wanna point out is that um, to make bone, you have cells that produce bone matrix. So with, as with every tissue in your body, they're made of cells. And these cells that make bone are called osteocytes. They secrete bone matrix, and then they basically get stuck or entombed in the very bone mineral that they produce. So in this little schematic, um, all these little specks, so um, you have the central canal with blood vessels in it, but all these little pink specks around, those are representatives of osteocytes. So if we really zoom in on the surface of this pizza wedge, 
Here's an example of osteocytes in a deer bone, for example. So the little arrows are pointing to these little black specks in the bone. So they're everywhere. I just pointed out a few here, but osteocytes produce the bone matrix and then get stuck in there. And the really cool thing is when we look at fossil bone, it looks pretty much the same. I mean, this is a Tyrannosaurus rex thin section. And so in this T-Rex uh, thin section, all the sort of tan material is bone mineral, but then all these little black tiny specks are those osteocytes or where the osteocytes would have lived when the animal was alive. So I've just highlighted them all in blue there. So each one of those little pits or specks is where a bone cell was and it produced that matrix around it. So because these osteocytes get stuck in the bone that they make, they need nutrients brought to them. They can't you know, get the nourishment that they need just by moving around. So you have blood vessels within the bone that actually distribute uh, uh, nutrients and remove waste from the osteocytes. And so this vascularity um, can be seen in the deer bone as well. These vascular canals are these larger um, holes. And in life, that's where blood vessels would be running up and down through. And again, you can see those in the T-Rex bone as well. So these blood vessels deliver nourishment so that those osteocytes can continue to live and basically provide upkeep to the bone. So putting this together, the reason I'm telling you this is so that you can start to recognize when I'm showing you pictures, what this bone is actually doing. So this is one of those um, top-down views of a pizza slice of bone. And the bone surface is up near the top here. That arced surface is the surface of the bone. So the marrow cavity would be uh, towards the bottom of the screen. And you can see all these little large black circles. These are your uh, vascular canals and teeny tiny little specks within this uh, very fibrous looking tissue are your osteocytes. So one thing we can do with, with bone is figure out relative growth. So was the bone being deposited quickly or was it being deposited slowly? And if you think about it, osteocytes, if they're secreting bone matrix kind of on the slow side, it's gonna be sort of orderly and arranged and layered looking. So this is an example of parallel fibered bone. So the fibers look like they're sort of layered from um, inner to outer surface. They just sort of look like pages in a book. This is um, considerably a relatively slow growth. It's typical of reptiles. So for example, this is the bone in an alligator. But small mammals and birds also produce this bone. Small animals don't have to grow very quickly because they don't have a big adult size to reach. So if you see parallel fiber bone, you can you could say that uh, the animal's growing relatively slowly. So um, an example in a dinosaur is this little hypsilophodonid, um, which is like a two-legged um, plant eater sort of uh, meals on wheels for, for bigger animals. But um, they, they grew to about a turkey or wallaby size. So in this image, the bone surface is to the left and the marrow cavity is to the right there. So you can see all these large holes or the blood vessels or where the blood vessels would have been. So you can see very orderly sort of arrangements of these wispy bone fibers. Holly, yeah. are we typically looking at like the middle of the shaft of a long bone when we see these slides? Yeah, so um, for histology, we try to take uh, thin sections from the bone shaft because um, the bone is pretty much just growing in um, uh, sort of getting thicker there rather than doing all crazy stuff with, you know, like the ends of the bones that are growing out or uh, developing processes. So you get basically an accretionary view of bone growth if you look in the, in the mid shaft, which um, provides the 
least complicated interpretation of bone. And if you're just trying to figure out how the animal was growing, you don't want to have to be trying to sift through processes and shape change and all of that. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so imagine like, you know, if you're eating a ham steak or something and you see that little circle of bone in the middle of, of your steak, that's pretty much the cross section that I'm after. Um, marrow cavity in the middle, just a ring of bone is what I'm looking at. So in each one of these pictures, you're just seeing a little pizza slice of that whole ring of bone. So yeah, good question. Anything else um, before I jump in? Okay. Um, and I have a feeling we might actually get video bombed by my friend's cat because he's circling. So <laughs> it's pretty um, we, common actually. So yeah. we, we kind of expect it. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you hear any off off uh, camera wailing, it's it's him. He's just saying hi. Okay. So the complete opposite of um, parallel fiber bone would be woven bone. And I wanted to put in a little schematic here at the top just to explain what's going on. Um, because with woven bone, you have your osteocytes, but they are producing their, their tissue, their bone fiber so fast that it's sort of disorganized and all over the place. And you leave these huge holes behind that do have blood vessels in them, but it looks more like Swiss cheese than you know, your nice little um, parallel fibered layers there. So um, think of the bone as just being put down, you know, it, fibers are more like pickup sticks where they're just sort of every which way. And so you're leaving behind huge gaps rather than nice orderly layers that are sort of filling things in. So when we see woven bone, um, it indicates moderate to very fast or high growth rates. And for example, today, we only see woven bone extensively in mammals and birds. So the image on the bottom left is um, bone tissue, woven tissue in a bird bone. And so the surface of the bone is that little corner on the upper right. And all of that blue, we stain the bone so that we can see it better. And you can see all those tiny little black specks those are your osteocytes. And then those huge spaces that are left behind, that's where the blood vessels are. Eventually this will be filled in and you'll get better defined blood vessel holes or, or vascular canals. But um, this is an indication of really rapid growth. And we can see that in dinosaurs too. So this is an example of an overaptor bone tissue. Um, we use polarizing light to really bring out the, the bone fiber, which is why it's so pretty. But again, you can see all the bone is sort of those pinkish and blues. All the osteocytes are those dark specks. Um, and uh, all of this, this whitish stuff that sort of um, where minerals have filled in the pore spaces. So lots of empty space growing really rapidly. From Holly, yep. about, about the mammals there, including, you know, these large groups like mammals, would, would you say it's pretty typical of all of them? Or is this something when you look across the spectrum of mammals, you're going to see a lot of variation? Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, you do see a lot of variation because woven bone tends to form when an animal is very young. And then if something, if it's something like a, a mouse, something small that has a very small end size, um, it will, typically you'll see that bone tissue change to parallel fibered, um, slowly deposited bone. Um, because when you're small, you don't need to add um, very much bone uh, to basically increase your size to the end size of something like a mouse. But if you're something like an elephant that, you know, is gonna just, end up being this huge gigantic thing. Um, typically in large mammals like that, we see rapid bone growth for many, many years before they reach um, or start approaching their adult size. And um, we see sort of everywhere in between with mammals too. Um, so you'll see woven tissue and usually around sexual maturity is when bones uh, growth starts slowing down because basically you are um, allocating your resources then to reproduction. So you're not growing as fast because the resources are going elsewhere. 
Um, and that's when you see the transition to more slow, slowly deposited tissue. But the interesting thing is today when we see this, um, we only see woven bone extensively in mammals and birds. Um, and that also has something to do with their metabolic rate. Um, you can only grow super fast and in a sustained way if you have an elevated metabolism. So um, it also can perhaps hint at the metabolism of the extinct animal that we're looking at if we see parallels in that bone tissue organization. So crocodilians don't end up being a good analog for dinosaurs then. Exactly. And they, so crocodilians, when they're very, very young, have been shown to deposit woven tissue, but it's when, you know, it's nice and sunny out and there's lots of food for them to eat, but um, they can't produce that tissue extensively. If the environment um, becomes kind of crappy, then they don't produce that tissue. Um, and then after uh, several years of growth, they typically transition into just that parallel fibered, slowly deposited tissue. So, the potential for them to do that is there, but um, it seems to be coupled with what they're experiencing as far as the environment goes. So another really cool thing about bone tissue is that it has growth marks. And I say growth marks because there's a bunch of different kinds, but the one that is most useful for paleontologists is the lines of arrested growth or lags. And um, lines of arrested growth, we've taken a look at animals today and it seems to represent a pause in growth in that um, it's hormonally controlled. So uh, growth hormone uh, affects when the animal's growing and when it pauses. And this pause seems to be annual. Um, it usually coincides with you know, the, the less, um, nice time of year. So, you know, winter or the drought season or whatever, when resources are, are less plentiful, but it seems to be something that if an animal takes more than a year to grow up, it pauses its growth in a predictable way each year. And uh, this is very similar to what trees do. So the, the great comparison that I like to make, um, and I think all paleohistologists makes, make are that these rings are basically like tree rings in that you can count them and age an animal and find out how old it was when it died. So for example, this image I'm showing here is one of those pizza wedge slices of bone. So the bone surface is this interface between the brown and the white. So this is the surface of uh, this bone. The marrow cavity would be down towards the right. And in this case, this is an alligator bone. And I'm pointing out each one of those lines of arrested growth. And so you can count them up and um, figure out, you know, um, that in this amount of time, uh, I see seven years worth of growth there. So um, with lags, they're not just confined to cold-blooded animals. We see these in warm-blooded animals that take more than a year to grow up. For example, this elk bone here, um, the bone surface in this case is towards the upper left. And so each one of those uh, arrows is pointing out a line of arrested growth in an elk. And then with dinosaurs, this is sort of the key to, um, to aging a dinosaur. We, because we know that they're annual in modern animals, we can make that inference or assumption that they're annual in extinct animals. And so we can find those lags in dinosaur bone and then count those up and get an age estimate for this cute little hypsilophan on it here, for example. So just in this image, there are three years worth of growth. So each line represents a growth pause. And then all of that tissue between the lines shows you how much the animal grew from year to year. So just that thickness between the lags can tell you wow, relative to this year, the animal is growing a lot, or, oh, I can see the animal starting to slow its growth year after year here. So even that spacing tells us a lot about dinosaurs and other extinct animals and how they were growing, when did they slow down, um, that sort of thing. So lags are so cool. 
there are other growth marks too. Um, so we can study teeth and um, there are daily lines of growth in teeth. Um, but uh, the one I wanted to touch on in particular today is this thing called a neonatal line. So in this image, we're looking basically like at a canine tooth that's been sliced up and down so that um, down towards the bottom, that would be the pulp cavity. And then up towards the top, there's your enamel so that like the crown or the point of the tooth is sort of up above this, um, the image there. But there's actually a line that develops in the teeth um, as the tooth is forming that basically separates the tooth growth before birth and then the continued tooth growth after birth. Birth is a very stressful event. Hatching is a very stressful, stressful event. So the hypothesis is that these lines are brief, brief pauses in growth because suddenly you're not getting all your nutrients from mom or from your egg. You suddenly have to start finding those nutrients for yourself, even if it is nursing or if you have to run off and, and find a little insect to eat or something. So um, that's a very stressful time. And there was a really cool paper that came out several years ago that showed this um, neonatal line, or in this case, it would be a birth line in, in the foal of a horse. So they've highlighted that birth line in red here so that you can see how much bone there was before the, the mom gave birth. And then um, after birth and the animal is still this little guy, um, how much bone is starting to be deposited after that, um, after that period. So we can find those in dinosaur bones too. So for example, this is a, a tibia cross-section through myasaura. Um, so the tibia is your shin bone. This is um, a nice complete image. It's a little crushed because um, bone tends to do that when it's about 76 million years old. It, um, it gets a little abused. So all, all the brown is bone. Um, the marrow cavity is that big white circle in the middle. And if we zoom in really close to the marrow cavity there, you can see a very distinct transition between the bone tissue that's sort of like big and woven and lots of holes. And then suddenly those vascular canals get really, really constricted. And then it's almost like that entire pattern sort of changes from that point on. And we do see this in modern animals, birds, um, other reptiles that hatch out of eggs. They have this uh, similar marking um, and sometimes it's referred to as a hatching line. And so it looks so similar to what we see in, um, in modern birds that uh, it's, it's really tempting to, to make that inference that this is probably the hatching line of this myasaura. So actually, you can actually figure out like the circumference of that tibia if we had more than just that crescent there. We could actually figure out the size of the, the bone when this little myasaura hatched out, which is just really cool then you have like hatching size. I don't know, it's so cool. Um, so those, that's sort of my paleohistology primer for everyone. And I wanted to show you all of that because now I wanted to briefly put together what I've been talking about and sort of use these building blocks to show you what we can do with it and how much we can learn with just the information that I've shown you today. So I've, I've introduced Myasaura. It's a, a duck-billed dinosaur. Um, it was the subject of my dissertation and um, it's just, you know, bled on from there. I I've, I've probably will never be done with Myasaura, but um, it was originally discovered based on baby bones. Um, my PhD advisor, Jack Horner, recognized these little baby bones for what they were as, as baby dinosaurs and then um, they started doing excavations and found all kinds of myasaura in this one area we like to call Egg Mountain, which is part of the two medicine formation. So the bone bed layer is um, all of the pinks and grays in the photo I have on the left. And that formation um, is through a, a pretty decent chunk of Montana. And it doesn't just stop at the border, it actually continues into Canada, but um, that's just its extent in Montana there. Um, 
the cool thing about it was that 76 million years ago, this was almost like beachfront property. It was sort of um, uh, the Piedmont area. So a little further away from the coast than, than uh, like the Judith River formation, but um, it would have been uh, prone to drought, sort of uh, ephemeral lake environment, um, uh, somewhat floodplainy. So the bone that I was particularly interested in um, was the tibia, again, the shin bone of um, Myasaura, because there were so many, there's a huge bone bed there, it's extensive, we've got jumbles of bone all over the place. So I picked the tibia because like Blaine was talking about earlier, it's a nice straight bone, it's got a very straight uh, bone shaft, doesn't have many processes coming off of it. So I could really learn a lot about the histology and how the animal was growing by focusing on just looking at tibia histology. So that's what I did for my dissertation. I um, selected a growth series of tibiae, which included animals all the way from hatching size all the way up to uh, full grown adults. But I wanted a huge sample. So I histologically examined 50 of these guys from all different um, you know, growth sizes. Holly, that leads to a, a question, and maybe you're getting ready to talk about it, but yeah. how do you get permission to cut all these uh, specimens? <laughs> oh, that's a, that is a great question. Um, so for, I was lucky enough that at the Museum of the Rockies, um, uh, Jack Horner was the curator at the time. And basically he had been cutting, thin sectioning dinosaur bones, um, you know, since I guess the 90s, maybe earlier than that. Um, so he was very, you know, hey, let's cut it up. Let's cut everything up. But when you go to other museums and you ask that question, sometimes you get just these horrified looks like you want, <laughs> you want to do what? Um, so with, with this project, it wasn't a problem, but um, I have to, for uh, other projects using specimens from other museums, I really have to um, put together a proposal and explain how um, I will be restoring the specimens if they need restoring and, you know, just uh, doing my due diligence for collecting as much data as I can before making that cut. Um, and when they are cut, is a wedge cut or is it cut in half? Um, I try to take an entire section out because uh, the bone tissue organization changes around the entire circumference. So if you just take a wedge or a core out on one side, you could get a completely different story than you would if you took that wedge or slice on the other side. And so you really need the whole story by looking at the entire section. And then the follow-up on that is, is what Chris was referring to earlier, because we've been talking about this is are we getting to a technology where we won't have to cut, where we can actually use other visualizing tools to, to see cross sections that would be good enough for us to interpret in the future? Um, I think eventually we might get there, but at this point, um, I've been doing a lot of like comparisons with micro CTs to see, you know, can they pick out the same lags that I'm seeing in bone? And if the lags are very definite and discrete, it seems that micro CT can do that, but if the lags are, are more fuzzy or they're sort of bunched together, it's harder for micro CT to pick them out right now. Um, the other issue with that is that um, micro CT and then synchrotron scanning is the other method that we could use. Um, the size of the specimen um, is sort of restrictive because um, we're still sort of restricted to, okay, we could put a bigger specimen in the scanning machine, but then you get less data, or we can put a smaller specimen in and really zoom in and get just terabytes and terabytes of data. But again, you're missing that picture. So it's sort of this trade-off that we're still having problems with right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some slides about the methodology um, that I had put sort of at the end, I'm happy to sort of break from this and talk about methodology now, or I can do that after I'm done. It, it's up to you guys. I'll just go ahead and go forward with the presentation. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with this sample set of 50 tibiae, um, I was looking at the, the midsection um, of the shaft in each one. And 
with that, um, I wanted to ask these questions. So with this huge sample set, I'm looking for variation within this, this population of Myasaura, um, because you, you know, for example, people today, we don't all grow to the same size. Um, they're short people, tall people, people in between. So how much growth variation would you expect in a dinosaur population? Um, on average, how fast did Myasaura grow? Um, can I infer anything about it being warm blooded or cold blooded? Um, how long did it take to get 20 feet long? Um, at what age did it begin to reproduce? Um, what was its posture like? Did it walk on two legs or four? So I was able to come up with some hypotheses for all of these questions, um, but I was going to highlight the first three in the main talk today uh, just to sort of add on or build upon what. Uh, the, the building blocks or the basics that I showed you guys earlier. So the first question, um, in order to find out how myosaur was growing, was it fast growing, slow growing? We have to look at myosaur's bone tissue and figure out what living animals today best match this. So again, here's our cross section through the middle of a tibia. Um, Brown is bone, fossil bone. Um, the marrow cavity is in the middle, so you've got that nice circular section of bone. And if we zoom in on a part of this bone, uh, this is myosaura bone tissue, uh, really, really magnified. So in here, the brown is bone. Um, when it's been buried for millions of years, the minerals in the water tend to stain bone different colors. Um, but then you can see within that brown, all those little black specks are, are osteocytes or, or where they used to live. And in this case, the vascular canals in myosaur are these long stretched out black squiggles. So it's a very interesting pattern. Um, but I need to find animals today that have this pattern so I can make inferences about how it was growing. So we know that dinosaurs are reptiles. Um, and we know that some of their closest relatives or the closest relatives living today are birds and crocs. So, you know, let's let's compare Myasaura to croc histology. Um, and there's really no match there whatsoever. We see in croc bone, it's very well organized. You can see actually a couple of lags in there. Um, but between the lags, you see very well organized layered tissue. Even the vascular canals don't really match up. They're just sort of these little circles. Um, so it, it doesn't really match Myasaura. But then if we look at the other related group, birds, this is an example of Rhea bone histology. This really looks like Myasaura bone. It's the, the black little specks, those are osteocytes. The vascular canals are those really long squiggles. Um, that's way better match than something like this, uh, this croc. But then is there anything else alive today that matches myosaur bone? Um, and come to find out large mammals like this elk really have similar looking bone histology to myosaur. And you might think, oh, well, well that's really weird because myosaur isn't related to mammals like it is to birds and, and crocs, but Going back to those first slides, remember bone is bone. It's, it's the same composition across all different uh, tetrapod groups. Um, it's formed the same way. So really what we're looking at here is not so much, doesn't have so much to do with relatedness as how these animals are growing. And so, you know, comparing in this case, a dinosaur to a mammal is acceptable because I'm looking at growth. I'm not looking at relatedness. So, it's amazing how similar this elk bone and this bird bone looks like myosaur bone. So I can say, yeah, um, myosaur is more similar in its growth patterns to these guys than it is to reptiles, like other reptiles, like crocs. But then now that I have this general idea of what to compare myosaur to, myosaur has legs. And we saw that that, that alligator, that croc had, um, had legs as well but the tissue types didn't match up. So what birds today have lags? Well, most birds grow to adult size in less than a year. So very few birds have lags, especially the really large ones. Um, 
Something like an emu, for example, grows to adult size in less than a year. So it's growing very quickly, but not over many years. The really cool thing is that large mammals, like again, this elk, grow very quickly, but over many years. So again, based on just this, this qualitative comparison, it looks like Myasaura was growing most like warm-blooded mammals do today, growing very quickly, but taking many years to reach adult size. So, I mean, without putting any numbers on this, this is still really cool to say Myasaura is doing this. Um, super exciting. But we can do better than that. So how fast is fast? I mean, you know, can we actually put some numbers on this? Well, it turns out we can. If we take a look at the histology of the tibia and cross section, we can do some mathy stuff. Um, so we can take tibia length. So remember I had 50 tibiae. If you measure the length of each one, and then you plot that against the circumference of the bone shaft for each one. So measuring the length and the circumference of each bone, you get this resulting graph. And basically what this shows you with this R square value. Um, so R square is basically telling you how well, if, if you have one value, you can predict the other. So in this case, if we have tibia length, how well can we predict tibia circumference? And the closer that value is to one, the better uh, predictor one value is to the other. So this is pretty awesome. A 0.95 value is really good in statistics and science. So basically what this means then is I can trace every lag, every growth ring in each one of these individuals and get the tibia length for each year of growth. So for example, in this guy, each one of those green rings, I can actually find using this curve and the associated equation, the tibia length for each year of growth, which is just so cool because this is the averaged Myasaura body length growth curve. If we take a little baby Myasaura that hatches out at about half a meter in length, it does a huge amount of growing in its first year. It gets over three meters long in just one year. And this seems insane, but we have uh, animals like buffalo, bison, cows that do this today. So it's not unheard of, um, it's, they're just tearing along. Um, and then of course, by its second year, it's uh, reached about five meters in body length. Growth is starting to slow down a little bit. So it did most of its growing in the first year. Um, and then as we continue on uh, in, in year three, growth is really starting to plateau a little bit. And then by eight years of age, Myasaura has reached adult size, which is about 20 feet in length. So just by doing that simple um, you know, linear equation, we can figure out Myasaura body growth from year to year. Um, so it was growing super fast. I mean, eight years old being that big, it blows kids' minds when I show them like, here's your tibia and this is a tibia of, you know, a fourth grader, yeah, it would be a fourth grader Myasaura basically. Here's a fourth grader, eight years old. Um, but then we can go and extrapolate that to body mass, which is more informative because in animals putting on weight in three dimensions. So what this curve is showing, each colored line is a different Myasaura individual from my sample. And like I was talking about earlier, people are all different. We all have individual variations. So we all grow at different rates. So each one of those colored lines is a Myasaura individual. Um, and some of them truncate early because, for example, a lot of them died in their second year. Um, that big blue one ended up being about 14 years old. So growth is sort of all over the place in Myasaura as it would be in, in people. But the black line behind everything, that's sort of averaging everything out. And then the gray on either side is basically the error bars um, for this graph. So um, mean growth curve tells you, you know, at eight years of age, how much body mass average a Myasaura would have. And then that gray is like the wiggle room. So it could be a little over that or a little under that. But 
um, the fact that we can do this now because of such this, this amazing large sample set is really awesome to be able to, to predict body mass in a dinosaur like that. So um, just wrapping up this presentation and uh, what we've learned um, from my story here and then sort of all the other stuff that I've learned since then, um, understanding what modern bone tissue patterns mean is really the only way to know what they mean in extinct animals. So we know a lot about modern animal bone, but there's a lot we don't know and we still need to figure out. Um, histology, as Blaine pointed out, is uh, some people call it destructive. I like to call it consumptive. Um, but it teaches us things we can't know just looking at the bone surface. Um, without doing the histology, I would have no idea how old any of those myasauro were when they died, how fast they were growing, um, anything like that. Um, and so what we know so far from the work that I've done is that myasauro had a high mortality rate um, and then it reached sexual maturity at about three years of age, grew to adult size in eight years, and may have switched from bipedal to quadrupedal, although my graduate student is testing that hypothesis right now. So that's basically to say, we still don't know everything histology can teach us, and we really need more people to study modern bone histology so that we can apply it to extinct animals. Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys for inviting me to be part of this. And if you're interested, um, please search the paleontology program at OSU CHS to see what kind of opportunities we have. And I'm always happy to talk to people about paleohistology. Um, so my contact info is there. Um, with that, this is my brief uh, presentation. Like I said, I do have methodology stuff I can talk about. Um, just let me know where you'd like to go. Any questions? Uh, well, my mind is just racing with, with ideas and questions, but I think we better jump over to uh, questions from our other co-host and also from uh, the audience out there. Sure. So we'll take this opportunity. Sorry, Chris, just real quick uh, to remind our audience, if you have questions, we've already gotten a couple sent in, but go ahead and start leaving your questions in the Facebook comments, or as I mentioned before, you can leave a question at the Gray Fossil site, Twitter or Instagram, and we'll start asking them for Holly here in a second after Chris goes. <laughs> I get to go first. Fantastic. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this stuff. Holly. Fantastic images. Uh, the, the gorgeous. Uh, you know, when we think about so you're at a health serve or a health sciences department, um, you know, we think about sickness, we think about health in in, in some of these extinct animals. Um, a lot of times as paleontologists, we go with the most obvious things. So it tends to be this is a broken bone that got healed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this thing got kicked in the head. That sort of thing. Tra trauma is, is really our our first approach to paleopathology. However, uh, you know, your techniques really lend themselves to getting at a much more detailed understanding of sickness and, and disease in some of these animals. And, and Jenny actually has a really good question that uh, she, she posted on Facebook. Have there been findings of metabolic bone disorders in dinosaur bones? So cancer has been found, but what about things like osteomalacia, osteoporosis, or reno, osteodystrophy, which I think I pronounced all those right, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, so um, one of the more uh, osteoporosis is fairly common, um, uh, arth arthritis, um, and then osteomyelitis is a huge one in dinosaurs, um, and it seems to be the avian version, which um, from what I understand is viral, um, and so that one's been uh, uh, suggested for several dinosaur taxa, including some of the little hypsilophodonids that I've studied in Australia, but the crazy thing is, is this for pathologies, it seems like a lot of pathologies, um, it's just crazy amounts of woven bone development that shouldn't be where, it, where the, the, the tissue actually is. So woven bone is like packing in the marrow cavity or making huge blobs around the, the bone itself. And um, the, I've, I've learned a lot about pathology, but there are folks that are paleopathologists that's focus specifically on that type of tissue. And um, 
you know, you really need to spend years and years understanding modern pathologies because they look so similar to each other um, histologically, as far as the bone ones go, um, to be able to tease them apart in the fossil record. So um, uh, for me, I've worked with a, a paleo pathologist previously to try to figure out what's going on um, in some of these bones and osteomyelitis seems to be pretty prevalent. Um, which is just this horrible condition, the bone sort of, um, it doesn't look recognizable anymore. It looks very lumpy and blobby and there are like um, uh, ulcers or, or, you know, pus channels and it's, it's disgusting. Oof. But um, uh, some of the studies that I've done have shown that uh, several of these dinosaurs were able to live a few years after uh, acquiring this problem. Um, just because the other bones remained unaffected. So you could basically count how many growth rings there were after the fact, um, which is kind of sad thinking, you know, there's this poor little dinosaur just limping along with this horrible uh, growth and, you know, finally got picked off. But <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating stuff. Here's another question from our audience. This is a, a short and simple and fun question from Jody, who asks, uh, which dinosaur has been your favorite to work on? Oh, man. Oh, there's so many. Um, I guess it's going to have to be Myasaura. So just because the sample size is so amazing that, um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of fun being able to get that much data from a particular animal and just keep learning more about what that data is telling us and then finding out questions or starting to ask questions about structures we we haven't seen or don't understand that need uh to be addressed so i guess that's been my favorite to work on um although um my sword is my favorite plant eater, but I think overall my favorite dinosaur has to be Tyrannosaurus. So it's been a lot of fun working on T-Rex histology, um, so sort of because, you know, that's been the dinosaur that I always loved growing up and to be able to work on that has been a lot of fun too. I had a question that I'd like to uh, ask. Mm -hmm. we, you mentioned throughout the presentation this uh, the, the potential issue of the fact that this consumes bone, it's a consumptive <laughs> process, as you put it, is there, is there a conflict there in the sense of like, are there bones you wish you could histologically study that are certain parts of the body that just no one would let you do it, like skull or something? Are there bones that turn out to be really handy because nobody, because they're low priority for saving, uh, mm -hmm. like ribs come to mind or something like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, what, where's the balance there? So for skull bones, they're, they're not so great for skeletal chronology. So counting growth rings or figuring out growth rates just because they're doing crazy things and changing shape all the time. So I've never wanted to ask to section skull bones, but um, teeth are often problematic because again, uh, you, can, you can figure out daily um, events by studying teeth, but teeth are really cool. So sometimes those are problematic. Um, I have a colleague who studies skull bones, but she's interested in um, like the jaw joints. So she has problems sometimes asking for permission to cut up skull bones, but she's asking different questions. Um, it's uh, Dr. Bayel. Um, she studies like jaw joints in birds and dinosaurs. Um, ribs are probably the one bone that I would say is like a throwaway bone that if, if someone doesn't want you to cut up a leg, they'll say, hey, but I've got a rib. Um, so paleontologists have really been working on trying to figure out, you know, what kind of utility do ribs actually have? Um, what, what are they good for? What can we learn? Because those are the bones that most people are like, okay, you know, I can, I can let you have that. Um, so we're still trying to figure out how good ribs are for certain things. And as far as sauropods go, it seems like ribs, um, have the potential to be really good for, um, aging a sauropod. Um, and they're also, uh, sauropod workers are trying to figure out how to connect, you know, the, 
the growth we see in a rib to overall growth rate because a rib's going to grow more slowly and at different rates than the whole animal because it doesn't have to support the weight of the animal. So the growth of a rib is going to be different, but they're trying to sort of connect rib growth to body growth so that we can, you know, infer one from the other if we have ribs. Um, and since you were asking me about consumptive or destructive histo, um, I can, I'd be happy to show that process now. I really want to show the process. Okay, please. So people go don't go, oh my God, what is she doing? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. okay. It's, well, it'd be, it'd be good. Okay. <laughs> so people get a sense of what it actually looks like. I didn't want to like incorporate it in the main body of my talk because I didn't want to um, spend too much time on it, but uh, I now because of the questions, I really want to show you guys. Well, this is, is something that's in the back of my head. How do you cut, uh -huh. you know, these giant <laughs> bones uh, that are, that are turned to stone? <laughs> Rock saw? I don't know. Yes. A really big <laughs> one. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Um, advance. Okay. So for sample removal, like you were saying, um, in my lab, I use three different kinds of saws. So there's the small isomet saw, which is like for tiny modern mammal bones. Um, then we've got the tile saw, which there's a, a myosaur tibia on the chopping block um, in that picture. And then I also have this ginormous band saw, which I've used to cut Tyrannosaur femora. So three different things to choose from there. They all use diamond blades. Um, and uh, they're water cooled. And so what you do, first off, you can um, make molds and casts. So the pieces that you're going to, um, that you've removed, which is what I'm showing on the left and the right there. So that's a big old chunk of tibia that um, is gonna be mold and cast before it, anything else happens to it. So that's one way we can preserve the bone um, by making molds and casts. And we can also 3D scan the bone before anything happens to it or um, even post. So if we take a, a piece out, we can 3D scan that piece that was removed before going on, um, which for example, on the bottom left, there's that tibia piece and the 3D scan image on the screen there. So um, with that, you can actually 3D print um, the specimen that uh, we want to cut. So this is a little baby myosaur femur on the bottom that's its 3D printed copy on the top. So there's lots of ways to digitize and preserve the specimen before actually doing the cutting. And then sometimes museums request that you restore the, the cast piece, the replica back into the specimen. So this is an example of um, Jane the T-Rex at the Burpee Museum and that spot right there with the yellow tag is the cast piece that was inserted back into the armature. So you can see it fits perfectly. You know, um, we painted it so that it, it resembles the bone, uh, but that's the piece that I removed so that we could do some histo on Jane's tibia there. So um, it's consumptive. I don't like to call it destructive because we can do things to actually make the, the specimen uh, restored. But for example, after you know taking the piece out, we have to embed the piece in resin so that it doesn't just crumble on us. So this is a, a smushed Tyrannosaur tibia there. Um, this is a Tyrannosaur femur that I used the bandsaw on. So we first embed, then we take a, a, a thinner slice off of the bone. Um, a couple of uh, millimeters thick is optimal. And then, for example, with this myosaurid tibia, um, this is our little slice. We glue it to a glass slide, and then we can polish it down on a, a standard lapidary wheel until it's so thin that light can pass through it. So once we do that, um, this is a, a tyrannosaur tibia that we've done the process on. So you can see it's just this beautiful amber color. Um, it's about, I'd say, 80 microns thick at that point, but it started out as that huge, like a thick block embedded in resin. But then once we get to that point, we can then use a petrographic microscope 
and actually start doing the data analysis. And then you come up with those beautiful pictures that I showed you in my presentation. So um, yeah, that's the methodology thing I wanted to show you guys. So that is so cool. Well, thank you so much for yeah, sharing yeah. that because I think we were really wondering Mm -hmm. see 3D, do they 3D scan these? Do they make casts? How do they, yep. this is way beyond um, what I had imagined was possible. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Taking a whole bone, uh, cutting out a, a, a huge cross section and then putting it right back into place. Yeah, and I, I really love showing stuff like that just to, to put people's minds at ease that, you know, I'm not coming in there with a chainsaw. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, leaving destruction in my wake. <laughs> well, thank you again. We're we're at the end of our time, yep, yep. Um, and so we'll wrap up there. David, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I think that's it. I just wanted to say a thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. Uh, we keep doing Paleo Talks because people keep coming to see it. So, <laughs> right. And I just wanted to add two final things too. Uh, lags are really cool, like you said. <laughs> I mean, like I'm in love with lags now. And you know, earlier when you said the kids' minds are blown when you show that and explain it, the adults' minds are blown. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. <I'm good. laughs> well, thank you again, Holly, for, for joining us and for teaching us so much about histology. Uh, Chris, do you have any final comments? I, I think I'm good. So I, I was wondering, you know, how big are these saws? And I got to see them. Blaine, we have two like that. So <laughs> yeah. It's yes. dangerous. So we're going to stay <laughs> after uh, this, and we're going to talk about some research questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Our the, the the fossils over at the museum over here are starting to get nervous. I think they are. <laughs> yeah. They should be. <laughs> I, I usually do little tiny holes, but uh, there is there are benefits to larger things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everybody for joining us, and thank you again, Holly. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks for inviting me.